Preface A of A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Hoffman. A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life by William Law. Preface A. Some Account of the Rev. William Law The Rev. William Law of King's Cliff, in Northamptonshire, was born in the year 1686, being the second son of Mr. Thomas Law, grocer. It is very probable that he received the rudiments of his education at Oakham, in Uppingham, in Rutlandshire. On the 7th of June, 1705, he became a student in Emmanuel College, Cambridge. In the year 1708, he commenced Bachelor of Arts. In 1711, was elected Fellow of the College of which he was a member, and in 1712, commenced Master of Arts. Soon after the accession of His Majesty King George I, Mr. Law being called upon to take the oaths prescribed by Act of Parliament, and to sign the declaration, refused to do so, in consequence of which he vacated his fellowship in 1716, and from thenceforward was distinguished by the name of a non-juring minister. That he was at one time a curate in London appears from a passage in one of his letters, not yet printed, or from some other good authority. But whether he acted in that capacity while fellow of Emmanuel, or soon after he vacated his fellowship, cannot now be determined. But it is well known that he soon went to reside at Putney with Mr. Gibbon, as tutor to his son Edward Gibbon, who was father of Edward Gibbon the Younger, author of The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. In the year 1717, Mr. Law engaged in controversy by writing in favor of the authority of the Christian ministry in a national church. In his parish church he joined in the public worship of God. In his parish church, and there only, he joined in celebration of the sacred rite of the Lord's Supper, and in the same ground with those who were united to him by these acts of religion, he lies interred. In the year 1727, Mr. Law founded an almshouse for the reception and maintenance of two old women, either unmarried and helpless or widows, also a school for the instruction and clothing of fourteen girls. In the year 1755, the lands appropriated to the support of his houses produced yearly 54 pounds sterling. They now produce 69 pounds sterling, a rise inadequate to the increased value of the produce. As Mr. Law's first publications were well received, and as he had been in Mr. Gibbon's family as tutor and chaplain for some years before 1727, he might have had the means of founding the widow's house, and of educating fourteen girls, without the assistance of any friend. And perhaps he did so, although it is by many believed that the money so applied was the gift of an unknown benefactor. By Mr. Thomas Law, now living at Cliff, the grandson of Mr. George Law, who was the eldest brother of William, it is said that while Mr. Law was standing at the door of a shop in London, a person unknown to him asked whether his name was William Law, and whether he was of King's Cliff, and, after having received a satisfactory answer, delivered a sealed paper directed to the Rev. William Law, which contained a bank note for one thousand pounds and it is believed by Mr. T. Law that by those means the small almshouse at Cliff was built and endowed. After Mr. Law retired to King's Cliff, he refused to take payment for the copies of his publications. It is said that his bookseller, Mr. Richardson, once prevailed upon him to accept one hundred guineas. At what time, after the year 1732, Mr. Law quitted Mr. Gibbon's house at Putney, and went to reside in London, the author of this memoir cannot learn. But he has authority for saying that, some time before the year 1740, he was instrumental in making Mrs. Hester Gibbon, his pupil's sister, acquainted with Mrs. Elizabeth Hutchison, widow of Archibald Hutchison, Esquire of the Middle Temple. Mr. Hutchison, when near his decease, recommended to his wife a retired life, 
and told her that he knew no person whose society would be so likely to prove profitable and agreeable to her as that of Mr. Law, of whose writings he highly approved. Mrs. Hutcheson, whose maiden name was Lawrence, had been the wife of Colonel Robert Stewart, and, when she went to reside in Northamptonshire, was in possession of a large income from the produce of an estate which was in her own power, and of a life interest in property settled on her in marriage or devised to her by Mr. Hutcheson. These two ladies, Mrs. Hutcheson and Mrs. H. Gibbon, much devoted to God and desirous of living entirely to His glory, by the exercise of love to their Christian brethren, formed the plan of living together in the country, and in retirement from that circle of society generally, but absurdly, called the world, and of taking Mr. Law as their chaplain, instructor, and almoner. We may be sure that their purpose was to cultivate those good qualities which best prepare the heart for the enjoyment of that blessed region where all worketh and willeth in quiet love. In execution of their laudable design, they took a house at Thrapstone in Northamptonshire, but that situation not proving agreeable to them, the two ladies enabled Mr. Law in the year 1740, or soon afterwards, to prepare a roomy house near the church at King's Cliff, and in that part of the town called the Hall Yard. This house had belonged to Mr. Thomas Law, and was then possessed by William the only property devised to him by his father. It had a good garden annexed, and a close of pasture ground, in one corner of which the small almshouse, built by W. Law, now stands. Part of the land at this time in possession of Mr. Law's kinsman, T. Law, was, in small parcels, purchased at different times by Mrs. H. Gibbon, and by her devised to the son of William Law's nephew, who made additions to the estate by purchases after Mrs. Gibbon's death, and dying unmarried, devised the whole to his brother, Mr. Thomas Law. The presence of Mr. Law, no doubt, contributed to make the house in the hall yard a blessed place of retreat, the whole income of his two female friends being devoted to the relief of the poor, and all their time to the cultivation of that good seed which the adorable lover of mankind had sown in their hearts. Mrs. Hutchison's annual income was little more or less than two thousand pounds, and that of Mrs. Gibbon nearly one thousand, as the expenditure within the house was, in all respects, remarkably frugal, very great must have been the expenditure without, so great as to make those at Cliff, who remember Mr. Law and his companions, say that their acts of charity were boundless. The daily distribution of food and raiment at their door never ceased nor the granting of occasional relief to the sick and needy. It is said that the report of such munificence spread to places far from Cliff, and produced applications from many whose wants were less pressing than the want of necessary food and raiment, and that such were often gratified by charitable donations. Mr. Edward Gibbon says that his aunt, Hester, was the original from whence the character of Miranda in the serious call was drawn. But as that lady was very young in her father's house when the serious call was written, it seems likely that she was rather an imperfect copy than a model, and that the original existed only in Mr. Law's imagination. It is said, and probably with truth, that Mr. Law, while employed by Mr. Gibbon as a tutor to his son, acted voluntarily in giving tuition to his daughter and that his pious instructions made an early and lasting impression on the mind of the female pupil, though they had but little effect on that of the brother. Why a considerable part of the family estate was devised to her and to her sister, Mrs. Elliston, mother of Lady Elliot, in prejudice of the heir at law, cannot now be accounted for in a satisfactory manner. After the lapse of half a century, Mrs. Hester Gibbon's share reverted into the natural channel by her will, and was for a short time enjoyed by Edward Gibbon, who long expected it, but not without apprehensions, that his aunt would devise it to some of those friends with whom she had spent her life. In the year 1761, on the morning of the 9th of April, Mr. Law departed in the joyful hope of a blessed life in regions of peace and love. 
he bore with patience the severe pains of an internal inflammation which caused his death. When near expiring, he sang a hymn with a strong and very clear voice. Either before he sang the hymn, or soon after, he is said to have spoken words by which it was evident that he felt the powers of the world to come. Quote, I feel a sacred fire kindled in my soul, which will destroy everything contrary to itself, and burn as a flame of divine love to all eternity. Unquote. In such a triumph of holy joy did this extraordinary servant of God resign his blessed spirit into the hands of his beloved Lord and Maker, at the place of his nativity, the town of Kingscliff, in the county of Northampton. And in the churchyard of that parish he lies interred, under a handsome tomb, erected in his memory by a particular and dear friend, who lived many years with him, and therefore had long known, and highly and justly esteemed his singular worth. Whether we take his character from reports or from his writings, we must revere his memory, believing that few have been his equal in this age, and not many in any age of the church. The wisdom given to him was such as we cannot suppose to reside in any but those who are of a contrite and humble spirit, and tremble at their master's word. By the words of which he was the author, during the last twenty years of his life, it plainly appears that, in love of all goodness, no persons exceeded him. In labors designed to draw all to the service of that master, of whose loving kindness and mercy he spoke copiously in all his writings, he was never weary. To speak good of his name seems to have been his greatest delight, and the first wish of his heart, that he and all mankind might enjoy the full benefit of that wonderful act of love by which the gates of heaven were opened to all believers. Deliver us from evil was his daily prayer, a petition suited to the minds of contrite sinners in all places and on all occasions, and, in his dying hour, not forgotten by Mr. Law. Between the years 1717 and 1737, he published several tracts, all in support of religion in general, accompanied with the earnest recommendation of good morals. Of these works, the best known is The Serious Call to a Devout Life. To this and other of Mr. Law's first writings, some object, as not dwelling sufficiently on the means of reconciliation to God, repentance, and faith. A few years before the publication of The Serious Call, he wrote a treatise on Christian perfection, which contains excellent doctrine. Some pages of his best style of writing may be found in it, but what that work proves might have been explained in fewer words. It appears to have been superseded by the serious call in public estimation. The style of his censure on the playhouse may be found fault with, but to the substance of the work no serious Christian will object. To such a one it must ever appear that the exhibitions at the theater cannot please any but those whose vain minds take pleasure in vanity. Quote, Vana Venus, unquote. It is to little purpose to dwell on this subject. Those who like shows, let what will be said, will always find arguments in defense of their favorite amusement, while those who in any degree regulate their lives by the precepts of the gospel Seeking salvation from a state of sin will avoid scenes where the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life find ample gratification. The serious call to a devout and holy life is by many thought his most valuable work. The design is first to show that devotion means devotedness to God, and that prayer, public and private, retirement for meditation and study, are but particular acts of devotion, and no more than means for the cultivation of the love of God and man. In the treatise on regeneration, in an appeal to all who doubt, and in the spirit of prayer, in the way to divine knowledge, and in the spirit of love, Mr. Law uses all the powers of his enlightened mind to establish this great fundamental truth, that God is love. He writes copiously on the fall of the first father of mankind, 
knowing that the necessity for the belief of the greatness of the remedy is best proved by showing the greatness of the disease. Mr. Law was in stature rather over than under the middle size, not corpulent, but stout made, with broad shoulders. His visage was round, his eyes gray, his features well proportioned and not large, his complexion ruddy, and his countenance open and agreeable. He was naturally more inclined to be merry than sad. In his habits he was very regular and temperate. He rose early, breakfasted in his bedroom alone on one cup of chocolate, joined his family in prayer at nine o'clock, and again, soon after noon, at dinner. When the daily provision for the poor was not made punctually at the usual hour, he expressed his displeasure sharply, but seldom on any other occasion. He did not join Mrs. Gibbon and Mrs. Hutchison at the tea-table, but sometimes ate a few raisins standing while they sat. At an early supper, after an hour's walk in his field or elsewhere, he eat something and drank one or two glasses of wine, then joined in prayer with the ladies and their servants, attended to the reading of some portion of scripture, and, nine o'clock, retired. When the children of his nephew came to his house, as they often did, he was much pleased to see them, and to take them on his knee. The youngest of them now, Anno, 1813, lives at King's Cliff, in the house which did belong to Mr. Law. From a printed account of the two charitable foundations at King's Cliff, in the county of Northampton, dated 1755. In the year of our Lord, 1745, Mrs. Hutchison set up a school in the town of King's Cliff, for the education and full clothing of eighteen poor boys of the town of King's Cliff, with a salary for a master well qualified to teach them reading and writing, and all the useful parts of arithmetic. Mrs. Hutchison, afterwards, bought a schoolhouse for the master, built a school, and four little tenements adjoining to it, for the separate habitation of four ancient and poor widows, chosen out of the town of Kingscliff with a weekly allowance. For the perpetual maintenance of these charities, the following estates have, by Mrs. Hutchison's order and appointment, been conveyed, surrendered, and sold for ever in trust to G. Leon of Southwick. W. Payne, King of Finnesdale, Esquires, to the Rev. C. Bates of Easton, to the Rev. W. Piemont, Rector of Kingscliff, to T. Jackson of Dunnington, Gent, to G. Law of Moray, Gent. One moiety of a certain number of closes in the county of Lincoln let for fifty-four pounds, land at Ascalon in the county of Nottingham, fifty-three pounds, two closes of Kingscliff, 18 pounds, 10 shillings, Dealey's Closes, 7 pounds, 10 shillings, Baxton's Close, 7 pounds, Close near the schoolhouse, 8 pounds, total, 148 pounds. Donatus O'Brien, of Blatherwick, Esquire, was, at the desire of Mrs. Hutchison, added to the six trustees before mentioned. The school, founded for the education and full clothing of fourteen poor girls of the town of Kingscliff, was set up by Mr. William Law in the year of our Lord 1727, with a salary for a mistress well qualified to instruct them in reading, knitting, and every useful kind of needlework. He hath since built a schoolhouse and school, and also two little tenements adjoining to the schools to be inhabited separately by two poor ancient unmarried women or widows of the town of King's Cliff, with a weekly allowance hereafter mentioned. For the perpetual support of these charities, he, the said William Law, hath conveyed for ever in trust to G. Lynn of Southwick, to D. O'Brien of Blatherwick, to W. Payne, King of Finsdale, Esquires, and to the Rev. C. Bates of Easton, to the Rev. W. Piemont, Rector of King's Cliff, to T. Jackson of Duddington, Gent, and to George Law of Moorhay, Gent, number one, the aforesaid school and schoolhouse, and the two little adjoining tenements, number two, on moiety of a certain number of closes at Northope, in Lincolnshire, let for forty-four pounds per annum, 
The gross annual income arising at present, anno 1813, from Mr. Law's portion of the estates amounts to 69 pounds. The gross annual income arising at present from Mrs. Hutchison's portions of the estates amounts to 308 pounds, 18 shillings, and sixpence. Mr. Law's, 69 pounds. Mrs. Hutchison's, 308 pounds, 18 shillings, sixpence. The rise of rent from 54 to 69 pounds at the end of 50 years must appear small when the increased price of the products of all lands is taken into consideration. Mrs. Hutchison died in January 1781, aged 91. Mrs. Gibbon died in June 1790, aged 86. The remains of Mr. Law were placed in a tomb built by Mrs. Gibbon. When Mrs. Hutchison died, her remains were placed by her particular desire at the feet of Mr. Law in a new tomb. Mrs. Gibbon was interred with Mr. Law. See a more full and complete life of the author with extracts from his works by R. Teague. 1813, sold by Hatchard, Piccadilly. Testimony Concerning Mr. Law by Mr. Edward Gibbon, Esquire, V.D. Memoirs. Quote, A life of devotion and celibacy was the choice of my aunt, Mrs. Hester Gibbon, who, at the age of 85, still resides in a hermitage at Cliff, in Northamptonshire, having long survived her spiritual guide and faithful companion, Mr. William Law, who, at an advanced age, about the year 1761, died in her house. In our family he had left the reputation of a worthy and pious man, who believed all that he professed, and practiced all that he enjoyed. The character of a non-juror, which he maintained to the last, is a sufficient evidence of his principles in church and state, and the sacrifice of interest to conscience will be always respectable. His theological writings, which our domestic connection has tempted me to peruse, preserve an imperfect sort of life, and I can pronounce with more confidence and knowledge on the merits of the author. His last compositions, and his discourse on the absolute unlawfulness of stage entertainments, but these sallies must not extinguish the praise which is due to Mr. Law as a wit and a scholar. His arguments are spacious and acute. His manner is lively, his style forcible and clear. Had not his vigorous mind been clouded by enthusiasm, he might be ranked with the most agreeable and ingenious writers of the times. While the Bangorian controversy was a fashionable theme, he entered the lists on the subject of Christ's kingdom and the authority of the priesthood. Against the plain account of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, he resumed the combat with Bishop Hondley, the object of Whig idolatry and Tory abhorrence, and, at every weapon of attack and defense, the non-juror, on the ground which is common to both, approves himself at least equal to the prelate. On the appearance of the fable of the bees, he drew his pen against the licentious doctrine, that private vices are public benefits and morality, as well as religion, must join in his applause. Mr. Law's master work, The Serious Call, is still read as a popular and powerful book of devotion. His precepts are rigid, but they are founded on the gospel. His satire is sharp, but is drawn from the knowledge of human life. And many of his portraits are not unworthy of the pen of La Bruyere. If he finds a spark of piety in his readers' minds, he will soon kindle it to a flame, and a philosopher must allow that he exposes, with equal severity and truth, the strange contradiction between the faith and practice of the Christian world. Under the names of Flavia and Miranda, he admirably describes my two aunts, the heathen and the Christian sister." Unquote. Such is the character this famous historian is compelled, by the spirit of truth, to give to the piety and goodness of Mr. Law. The list of his works, which we now insert, together with two excellent letters from clergymen in the established church, referring to them and him, is taken from the Gentleman's Magazine, November 1800. His works are, number one, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life, 
adopted to the state and condition of all orders of Christians. Number two, a practical treatise upon Christian perfection. Number three, three letters to the Bishop of Bangor. Number four, remarks upon a late book entitled, quote, The Fable of the Bees, or Private Vices, Public Benefits, unquote. Number five, the absolute unlawfulness of stage entertainments fully demonstrated. Number six, the case of reason, or natural religion, fairly and fully stated. Number seven, an earnest and serious answer to Dr. Trapp's discourse of the folly, sin, and danger of being righteous overmuch. Number eight, the grounds and reasons of Christian regeneration. Number nine, a demonstration of the gross and fundamental errors of a late book called, quote, A Plain Account of the Nature and End of the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper, unquote affectionately addressed to all orders of men, and more especially to all younger clergy. Number 10. An appeal to all that doubt or disbelieve the truths of the gospel. Number 11. The spirit of prayer, or the soul rising out of the vanity of time into the riches of eternity, in two parts. Number 12. The spirit of love, in two parts. Number 13. The Way to Divine Knowledge, being several dialogues between Humanus, Academicus, Rusticus, and Theophilus, as preparatory to a new edition of the works of Jacob Bayman and the right use of them. Number 14. A short but sufficient confutation of the Rev. Dr. Warburton's projected defense, as he calls it, of Christianity in his Divine Legation of Moses, in a letter to the Right Reverend, the Lord Bishop of London. Number 15. A collection of letters on the most interesting and important subjects, and on several occasions. Number 16. Of Justification by Faith and Works. A dialogue between a Methodist and a Churchman. Number 17. An Humble, earnest, and affectionate address to the clergy, his works making in all nine volumes. Scarborough, December 21, 1771. Quote, Sir, sunt certa piacula, queti ter perlecto poterunt recura libello. Horace. Unquote. As I have an universal love and esteem for all mankind, so particularly for my brethren of the established church, of which I should think myself an unworthy member, did I not take all opportunities of doing good, according to the abilities which God hath enabled me. But, as I have ever thought a concern for men's souls to be preferable to that of their bodies, so I have, in a more special manner, extended my charity to that better part. We live in an age where numerous objects present themselves to our view, that are destitute of every virtue that can make them worthy of the divine favor, and consequently there never will be wanting occasions for exercising ourselves in a laudable endeavor for their amendment. I, for my own part, though I live, when at home, in a small country village, have had sufficient work upon my hands to bring my parishioners to any tolerable degree of piety and goodness. I preached and labored amongst them incessantly, and yet, after all, was convinced my work had been as fruitless as casting pearls before swine. The drunkard continued his nocturnal practices, and the voice of the swearer was still heard in our streets. However, I was determined to leave no means untried for bringing this profane and obdurate people to a sense of their duty. Accordingly, I purchased many religious books and distributed them amongst them. But alas! I could perceive no visible effects. In short, I had the grief to find that all my labor had proved in vain, and was ready to cry out with St. Paul, Who is sufficient for these things? About this time I happened to peruse a treatise of Mr. Law's entitled, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life, with which, if I may be allowed the expression, I was so charmed and greatly edified, 
that I resolved my flocks should partake of the same spiritual food. I therefore gave to each person in my parish one of those useful books, and charged them upon my blessing, for I considered them as my children, to carefully peruse the same. My perseverance was now rewarded with success, and I had the satisfaction of beholding my people reclaimed from a life of folly and impiety to a life of holiness and devotion. Before I conclude, I must beg leave to recommend the aforementioned book to the perusal of all your readers, and I heartily wish that they may receive as much benefit therefrom as those who are committed to my charge. This excellent treatise is wrote in a strong and nervous style, and abounds with many new and sublime thoughts. In a word, one may say of this book, as Sir Richard Steele did of a discourse of Dr. South's, that it has in it whatever wit and wisdom can put together. And I will venture to add, that whoever sits down without prejudice, and attentively reads it throughout, will rise up the wiser man and better Christian. It remains now that I mention a word or two concerning the author. This worthy clergyman has been accused, by those lukewarm Christians who ridicule all degrees of piety that are above the common standard, as Methodism, a charge as false as it is cruel. I say not this as my own private opinion, but from the testimony of several gentlemen of undoubted credit, who are acquainted with his manner of life and conversation. Indeed, this is sufficiently demonstrated in many parts of the author's works, particularly in his three letters to the Bishop of Bangor, wherein he writes in vindication of the rites and ceremonies of the Church of England all which evidently declare the reverend author to be an orthodox divine and an indefatigable laborer in the lord's vineyard oranius end of preface a this recording by robert hoffman